morning. Take your hymn books. Take your hymn books. 199. 199. Hark the herald angels sing. Can you stand with me this morning? 199. I'll give you a couple, couple seconds to find your spots. Find that hymn book. 199. I think we're singing one thing and we're playing another thing. 199? Do we have 199? We do? It's written on, it, we have it written down wrong in the bulletin. I'm sorry about that. It's, in, it's 196 in the bulletin. But Hark the Herald Angel Sing is actually 199. Okay. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Again, apologize for that uh, mistake. We try to put four to five mistakes in every bulletin. No, no, hear me out, all right, because if not, you won't read it. And so now you're looking for more, all right? And so that's, those do happen on occasion, and I apologize for that. We were trying to put it together a couple different locations of computers, so we missed that one. But uh, that'll see, now you're going to be very eagerly searching the hymnal to see if the next one's right, all right? So that'll get you excited. But again, that happens sometimes. Be flexible. We're glad that we can, uh, we can correct those things in a service and not always have to have everything perfectly right, all right? So glad to have you here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask the Lord to bless this service, and that he would be honored. Father, we come to you this morning as we gather together here at Independent Bible Church of Lord. Lord, we recognize we are not the only church. Lord, we are simply one local church that gathers here in this building in Duryea for your honor and glory. Lord, I pray we've come today to worship you, to glorify you, to minister to one another in the Lord. I pray, Lord, today that we be eager to be in the word of God, to hear the word of God preached, to lift up our voices in praise, to worship you. I pray we've come today to minister and serve others using the gift or spiritual gifts you've given us as children of God. And Lord, may we be an encouragement, a comfort, 
uh, an exhorter today among those in Christ. Lord, we thank you again for the privilege to gather this time of year as our hearts are very much toward Bethlehem and the manger and the baby. And we thank you that Jesus Christ was born to die for our sins. Lord, without Calvary, uh, Lord, the manger wouldn't mean that much. Lord, without the baby in the manger born of a virgin, Calvary wouldn't be effective. Lord, we thank you that the Christmas story is both the manger as well as the cross and the empty tomb. Lord, it's our prayer that each person that gathers this morning or watches from home would know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and have the hope of heaven for eternity. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat as Charlie comes for this next hymn. Okay. 212, go tell it on the mountain. Let me tell you what to do with this song. Go tell it on the mountain. 212. Now, when you turn there, turn there you're going to see that you have the first two lines. Very familiar uh, lines of go tell it on the mountain, and then we have the verses, the last two lines, and 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 uh, when you see at the end there, DC, uh, right at the top of the very last line there, of the verse, DC Alfine needs to go back and repeat the two, uh, the the two, uh, the two first lines. So what do you need to do? Just keep on singing, singing, through to the bottom, go out back up to the top until I tell you to stop, so, until we finish with all the words. Understand? All right, 212, go tell it on the mountain. 212. Jesus. 
2, 2, 19, 2, 19, Silent Night, Holy Night. We're going to see in the first, the third, and the fourth verses of this. The first, third, fourth verses of this. 2, 19, Silent Night, Holy Night. And if the pianist can give us a chord, I would like to sing that first Sansa, you know, some of you that know me, I like a cappella very, very much. And not just I, but also those that listen on our live stream. They, they say that the only time that they can hear you guys is when we sing, uh, sing a cappella. So, so if you want all those people to hear you now, uh, stand with me and we'll sing that first verse, a cappella. Yeah, let's give us a chord here.
At God's appointed time, Jesus Messiah came to make the sacrifice for all sin. No longer bring a lamb, Jesus has paid the price. Clap your hands and let your psalms begin. Sing alleluia, praise you Jehovah, worship the God of Abraham. Sing alleluia, praise you Jehovah, once for all this slain God's perfect Lamb. Amen. Great message. Appreciate that, Charlie. I hope that you've let Charlie know that you appreciate uh, his internship serving the Lord here, whether in music or just service or Kids for Truth. He's going to be hitting the road, I believe, Thursday, all right, after uh, Wednesday night Kids for Truth. They have their big Christmas activity. Then he's going to be uh, hitting the road also for North Carolina. Now, his parents live probably 20 minutes on back roads from my wife's parents, all right? And so he'll be down in that same neck of the woods for about a week, so you pray for him. He'll be gone, but I hope that you also uh, let him know that if God's using him in your life as a ministry, you let him know that and express your thanks for that, okay? All right, we're going to dismiss it this time. Our children's church, three-year-old through sixth grade, as well as adult teachers and assistants. All right, we'll let them slip out, and that would be three years old through sixth grade. All right, appreciate all of our teachers and workers. Usually you have a teenager that helps in each of the classes as an assistant. Crowd control, fishy taster, whatever the teens do. Officially taste the snacks, all right, and all of that. But appreciate all of our workers and helpers. Sometimes we forget about it. But while we're up here, uh, there's almost in a way little services going on in different age groups. The Word of God is taught, songs are sung. Sometimes prayers offered, praise, and the Word of God is influencing children for His honor and his glory. You ready to turn in those Bibles today? We're going to be a little bit here and a little bit there, all right? And so I don't have our normal pulpit, so I don't have a pulpit Bible beside me to tell you where to turn. So if you don't know where to turn, maybe there's someone beside you that can help you. Look left and right, be a servant, and say, I can help you find that. Uh, better than just getting discouraged and just sitting there listening, all right? You need to have the Bible, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, of the mighty living Word of God, and it needs to speak to you, and so you want to open that Bible up. Now, you're going to find your way to Isaiah, Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45. Now, that can be somewhat tricky for some. It's probably about the middle of your Bible. If you turn about where it's about halfway, you should get close to it. If you open the Psalms, Proverbs, go a little bit to your right. Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah. 1037. If you have a pulpit Bible or you want to grab one of those, Page 1037 will get you to Isaiah 45. Thank you, Rick. Isaiah 45. Now, we're going to be a lot of places. We really won't be in Isaiah, but we'll be uh, in Exodus, and then we'll be in the New Testament a little bit today. So be ready to turn and see what the Word of God says this morning. All right, Isaiah 45. Now, if you're with us today, maybe watching from home for the first time, perhaps you've been out of town, maybe some of you were sick, some of you are visiting. Glad again to have you today. Uh, we're in a short series that'll take us up through the new year on, basically, we're looking at the two kingdoms, uh, God's kingdom, Satan's kingdom. We looked at God's plan, Christ's mission. We looked at last week, Satan's plan, Satan's mission. Today, the title of the message is God's plan, Israel and the church. Israel and the church, if you're taking notes. God's plan, Israel and the church. Before we look at some scripture, let me give you a little review, get you thinking. Now remember, the devil is active. Walks about seeking whom he may devour. Christ told Peter, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to dilute your minds. He wants you to fall asleep, be daydreaming, thinking about all the shopping and the gifts and all that you've got to do, the, the bills that need to be paid and they're not there. And he wants you to think about all that you've got to do between now and family coming in and all this stuff. He wants you to be distracted and dismayed. He wants uh, buzzers to go off. You to be looking at your clock, all kind of stuff. A little buzzer, a little moth flying around. Get your attention. Boy, you see that all the time at camp, all right? Uh, kids get there. Oh, any little thing. Someone leaving the room. Now, if you have to leave and it's an emergency, that's fine. A little things. You'd be amazed at how quickly you can get off track from the Word of God. 
All right. The word of God, which is quick and powerful. So you're not here today. I hope to listen to me. Whoever it is that preaches the word of God, the Bible reigns supreme. Uh, there's a reason the pulpit is in the very middle. Didn't used to be that way in a lot of church meeting houses. Some of you went to churches where there's two things on the sides. All right. The central thing maybe was a big organ or something like that. I remember that at the Methodist church I grew up in. But uh, you may know that a lot of times, and now it was, it was that way in many churches, but in, after the Reformation, when a lot of churches, they moved the pulpit in many places to the center, showing the importance and the centrality of the preaching of the Word of God. All right? That the Bible should be the center. The Bible should be the number one thing that's focused on. And so I'm glad that we have the pulpit right here, and the Word of God is the supreme thing. So let's review. Let's review. God is sovereign. Sovereign. The end of the word sovereign is the word reign, R-E-I-G-N. Like we say, a king reigns. He rules. So sovereign means that God rules. He is supreme ruler of all. He is creator. He is called in the Bible the Almighty One. Alpha, Omega, beginning, end. He's eternal. He had no beginning. He has no ending. He's self-existing, unchanging, all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing. The Bible states he rules and reigns. There is none else. Now that's a Bible fact. You'll see that here in one of the great chapters of the Bible. Look at Isaiah 45. You're there. You'll see this repeated throughout. If you've never read this chapter, uh, don't read it today in the service, but read it this afternoon. All right? Look at Isaiah 45.5. Isaiah 45.5. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. Look at the end of verse number six, the last sentence. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Look at verse 12 of Isaiah 45. I have made the earth and created man upon it. There you go. That ends any debate you might have of how we got here. All right. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. Look at verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He established it, he hath created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. We have one more to go. Look at verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. God is supreme. There are not hundreds of gods. There are not thousands of gods. There are not eight gods. There is one God. One God who reigns supreme, that is almighty God, the God of the Bible, Jehovah. He states throughout the word of God, there is none else. I am, and notice the call to everybody, look unto me, all the ends of the earth, every person, nation, culture, creed, language, your greatest need is to look to me and be saved. I am God, there is none else, there is no other truth. Now, we keep all that in mind, we realize though that here on earth, Satan's kingdom right now. So for all that God says and God offers and the truth, and if you look at words in the Bible, what do you associate with God and his kingdom? Light, life, salvation, freedom, grace, mercy, joy. Sometimes that's missing in many so-called believers. God is holy. He is righteous. He is just. You can trust him. Believe his word. Now that's God's kingdom. Let's look at the alternative. Satan. Satan is adversary. The devil, the serpent, the dragon, the accuser of the brethren. He rules temporarily on this earth. We looked at that a lot last week. He is the ruler, small g, small god of this world, this world right now. Temporarily has rulership on planet earth. You're in Isaiah. Go backwards just a little bit to Isaiah 14. Go back a few chapters to Isaiah 14. Hey, how are we doing? We've been, I've been preaching now for four minutes. Are you distracted yet? I, there's some that haven't even opened their Bible. There's some that haven't even looked at it yet. All right? Uh, and if you have a reason why not, you better be careful on that one, why, why you don't need to do it. All right? Why you're the exception. Uh, believe me, the devil would love for you just to sit and soak in church and to pat yourself in the back and that you're okay. He's not talking to you. You're not a liar and a murderer and a cheater and a thief. You're here today. You're here today. You're good. All right, Isaiah 14. Now we have Satan, though, in his kingdom. God of this world is called. Prince of this world, Christ calls him. 
temporary reign or rulership over this world. What do you associate with the devil? It's the very opposite, right? Light, darkness. Life, death. Sin, salvation. Joy, misery, and bondage. Yet why do so many choose that kingdom? Isaiah 14, you know why Satan, what he wants, the Bible tells us. Isaiah 14, look at verses 12 through 14. This was Satan when he tried to usurp God's kingdom. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, here we know what he was thinking, what he was trying, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's what Satan, perhaps that's what I want. I will rule. I will get worship. I will reign supreme. Now he hasn't changed on that, though he was cast out of heaven to earth. We know exactly who he is. He's evil, wicked, corrupt. What did Jesus say in John 8, 44? You have your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. He, he's a father of lies, and there is no truth in him. Do you understand that truth that Jesus just said? There is no truth in Satan. None, ever. You say, but yeah, but some of what he says is true. But you have a wrong definition of truth. Truth is 100% true. You say, well, 95%, I told a lie. It was just a little fib. We like to say stuff like that. That was the devil that got us started on that. Little fibs, little white lies. A, a lie, a truth is 100%. If it's not 100%, it's not true in any way. And the Bible says that Christ said Satan is not capable of truth. There is no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of it. So whatever he whispers or tells you or shouts loudly, it's a lie. It is a lie. This won't harm you. No one will know. It's just private. Keep it to yourself. Don't. It's a lie. He can't tell the truth. You can't trust God. You're worthless. You'll know. It's a lie. You cannot tell the truth. He is evil and corrupt and vicious. Now he's crafty and he's subtle and he can mix and match and he knows the scriptures and he can quote the scriptures and he would run circles around you. And if he was here today, he wouldn't be in the back in the dark with a hood and a goatee. And, and, his little, no, and, and no Bible and cussing and using profanity. He'd be on the front row in his suit, singing the songs, and you'd be impressed, and you'd say, I hope he joins. I like him. He's good. He's got to be, amen, absolutely. He can do all of that. He's not against any of that. He's called an angel of light. He can transform himself into anything you think, and he'd be happy for you to believe that he can be trusted. Yet the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Now, I don't know in here who's a believer. If you're in here today and you're not a child of God, Satan is actively and is, has blinded your minds to the truth. You may be blinded to the fact that you think you're saved, you're going to go to heaven. That's the greatest lie. The greatest lie that the devil can tell you is that you're okay. And that you're going to go to heaven and everything's fine. That is his greatest lie. And if you believe that lie and don't do what God says, he's deceived you. And you will find yourself in the hell created for him. He wants you to think you're fine. It's okay. What are you not talking about me? I'm not in prison. I'm not one of those awful people. I'm a good person. I'm here today. I'm taking notes. My Bible's open. But you've never received Christ. You're trusting in something else, good works, something that just happened that made you. Hey, Satan's capable of giving you anything you want. He can deceive you. He can make you feel lots of things and think lots of things. You better have it based on the Bible now. The Bible, all right, is what we're looking at here. Almost, almost channeled Grandpa Billy there. The Bible, I say, the Bible, all right. That came back to me if you're at the cantata. That's what we stand on around here, all right. Sorry there, Keith had to throw that out there to you, all right. Back to the message, all right. We've got God. He's life. He's everlasting grace and mercy and salvation and freedom. All that he has in his abode is heaven. And most people want to go there. Because it's, it's where God lives. It's who God is. It's, it's wonderful, right? It's the dwelling place of God. It's his kingdom. It's the center of his kingdom. It's where his throne is. God rules in heaven. Who doesn't want to go there? It's life. It's light. It's joy. No sin. No death. No sorrow. No scars. No guilt. No any of those things. 
That's awesome. That's what God is. Now, in contrast that to Satan and his kingdom. He tries to make this earthly kingdom as appealing as possible, although we look around, we watch the news, we get discouraged, we, we oh, what is going on? It's evil, it's wicked, it's corrupt, murder, pride, selfishness, and that, and that could just be you. And then you can expand it to your own family. And then you can expand it just to your own town, and then your own state, and then your own country, much less the entire world that's just messed up and we need help. What's going on around here? Wars and everybody hates one another. That's Satan's kingdom. That's who he is, and yet he makes, us, he makes us long for this world. He makes us act like heaven. Oh, I don't know if I want to go. I still like it down here. Not right now. What are we going to do there? It's going to be boring. Who, where, where do you think that's come from? And how many believers? How many believers are so attached to this world? You love it. You love the world. You love the toys, the music. The, you love everything about the philosophy of the world and all that it promotes, which is the devil's. And he, and he makes you think that, oh, you don't want to surrender to God. You can't trust God. You're going to be miserable. Well, if you go to church all the time, if you give your money, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. And he is the master. That if you do anything, well, you have to give up everything. You'll be so awful and terrible and penniless and die. And, you know, and he makes us long for this world. But yet when we look at the very facts of just the news and looking all around us and look in the mirror... We need help. We need help. And all that God offers is the very opposite of all that Satan offers. And so we come to what? The great problem. You and I are sinners. We're born sinners. We are sinners. The Bible says that we are hopeless and wretched and miserable and dead and lost in trespasses and sins before salvation. I mean, we are dead. We are guilty. We are condemned. We, we are, our destination is sure. It says in John 3, the wrath of God is upon us. We are caught, looked at as wandering sheep without a shepherd, aimlessly going in our own direction, following our own way and our own instincts and what makes sense, trying to make it through this kingdom, trying to do the best that we can. And we might think we're pretty good and nice and we try to help people, but we're lost, the Bible says. None righteous, no, not one. The Bible says before salvation, we are separated from God, hopeless and lost. And there's the big question, then what in the world can be done? I thought you said God reigns supreme. Doesn't seem like it. And by, by the way, guess who put that question in your mind? Yeah, you can't trust God. If you're one of those that always asks those questions, now it's not wrong to ask those, I don't believe, if you're asking the right spirit. You'll see Bible characters asking those same questions. But if you're so hung up all the time on, what's God, what's he doing, I can't believe it, how can he let this happen? You're a person that I don't believe really reads your Bible much, probably watch a lot of the world, you get a lot of influence from the world and all the Satan's devices and things. You just get a lot of that in here, you look at the Bible very casually, and you don't really have a proper view of God. And so you question him con constantly. Uh, sickness, cancer, death, any little thing that happens that doesn't seem fair. You just, you want to act, and the devil delights in that. He thrives on that, and he wants you to get angry and bitter. He doesn't want you to think you can trust God, and God has it out for you, and you're nothing. He thrives on that, and he puts those lies, and he sows those seeds. Oh, what can be done? I thought you said God reigns supreme. And then we start playing the game of, I was God. Never entertain that. I mean it. Never entertain that. Never. You think it's cute to play that game. It's not. It's the same thing he said in the garden. You'll be his gods. You can make the rules. Why, if I was God, don't ever play that game. Don't even go there. The Bible says you better cast those down as false imaginations. Stronghold the devil and you better know the scriptures. And don't even go there and entertain those or let your, because your emotions will take over. Uh, the world's influence will take over. Uh, you're not strong enough. The devil will... Bat you around like a cat and a mouse. You are no contest for the devil. He is not as scared of anybody in this room. All right? You don't threaten him in any way, and you are weaklings. Unless you know the Bible and the Word of God and the blood of Christ and are a child of God and know how to use it. All right? And so we have that conflict through the ages. And what is God's answer before we really get in the Scripture and dig? Well, the answer we know is Jesus Christ. Right? The cantata. Then Jesus came. What's God going to do? It looks like Satan's winning. It looks like he's in control. Is there any hope for mankind? All the earth was plunged into sin and darkness. Looks like Satan wins. Last thing for Satan to do is just take over and defeat God. And he, maybe he can do it because it sure looks like he's doing pretty good down here. And we begin to question. And yet the answer is Jesus Christ, the Savior. Never forget that. The Deliverer. 
The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. God sent not His Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, delivered. He might destroy Him that had the power of death, that is the devil. That He might destroy the works of the devil. Christ came triumphant as the Creator, but He came as the God-man. He came born of a virgin, in the flesh, in the lowly manger, among the stench of animals. As a humble birth, He came as the Lamb, the suffering servant. None of us would give Christ a second glance if He walked through the crowd. Like he's often portrayed on TV as very handsome and rugged. Now we wouldn't even look at him. We'd probably even make fun of him and mock him according to Isaiah 53 perhaps. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. No form or comeliness that we would desire him. We might make fun and make sarcastic remarks about him. He didn't come as king. He came to die for our sins as a deliverer. He came to proclaim the truth. He came to reveal God's plan, because he said, I and my Father are one. You don't have to ask, what would God do? What's God like? How does he think? I and my Father are one. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he said. So we, we see Christ, the God-man, as he came to earth. So now is the question. So, all right, preacher, what is God doing then? <laughs> well, what's he doing? Well, what was he trying to accomplish in the Old Testament? What's he doing right now in the New Testament? Well, before we turn to Exodus here, I want to give you a quick background. And we're going to really jump into things. We're going to look at Israel. We're going to look at the church. And we're going to see if you can understand God's plan according to the Bible. You know there's a conflict. You know that God reigns supreme. So obviously if God is going to prove that he reigns supreme, he has, he has to crush Satan. He can't. If, if he doesn't, then he... You can't say he's supreme. He's still so God has to defeat Satan once and for all. And then he has to defeat the things that Satan did. He corrupted earth, God's creation, which was perfect. He corrupted man, which was perfect. He did all. So God's going to have to reverse those and show his power. He's going to have to restore the earth to exactly what it was. He's going to have to restore mankind. He's going to have to establish his kingdom. And that is Bible prophecy. I hope you study that. No, what in the world is God doing? He's going to have to do all of that to show that he reigns supreme. So when we look at the Bible in the big picture, we want to start at creation. In the beginning, God created. If you study Bible dates and ages, now for some, if you grew up in secular education and were force-fed evolution, then this will blow your mind. For some, they have a hard time. You've been taught millions and billions of years. So there's no proof of that, and it's never in the Bible. All right? According to the Bible, we would say roughly the earth is six to 8,000 years old. Most would hold to around 6,000 years old. 6,000 years old, that's it. 6,000, pretty young, all right? Pretty young earth. Though it was created in time as God created, it wasn't created as young. Was everybody wasn't a baby. Not, not all the animals were babies. It was created. If you cut down, if Adam cut down a tree on the, first, on the first day he was living and counted the rings, all right, it wouldn't say one day old. It might say, oh, this thing's 120 years old. No, well, no, it was just created. God created it in his form and fashion as he did. So from creation to Abraham is about 2,000 years in your Bible. From creation to Abraham. 2,000 years, one-third of human history. No Israel. No church. Nothing. There was no Israel, no nation of Israel, no, no, no scripture really, no Bible, no Old Testament law, no law of Moses, no temple, no tabernacle, no synagogues, no churches, nothing. It was God, man, dealing with man, all right? And if you study that history of that, you're going to see Satan constantly bringing apostasy, wickedness, the entire earth, almost except one man, but Noah, right? Except for Noah, all right? Noah found grace. The ark, God preserved. There were eight people. Okay, but it kept going back. Okay, so now God chooses Abraham, Genesis 12. God and his sovereignty, and this was not like a thought. God has always known this. God has always known all of this. He's eternal. Nothing has ever occurred to God. God starts with Abraham, and from Abraham to Moses, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, is about 500 years. We're just rounding. It's about 500 years from Abraham up until the children of Israel come out and they're sort of like a nation. The nation of Israel, the plagues, going into the land of Canaan. They're a nation, okay? Now, but again, no temple, no, even really the books of Moses were just being written perhaps. No, no, not, no church and really even Israel wasn't even really Israel yet. 
Then we come to the nation of Israel, which is a lot of the Old Testament, all right? They come into the land, they possess the land, they divide the land up, and then you have all these time periods of the judges and the kings and Saul and David and Solomon and all of this, and you have the kingdom of Israel, all right? God's people, Israel. And that goes the whole way up through the time of Jesus and the book of Acts, as a, as a nation, if you would, though there's lots of stuff that goes on in between there, ups and downs and captivity and punishment. And, and now there you do have the law of Moses and you have the Old Testament and you have the tabernacle and you have the temple and you have all of those things. We're going to get to that. Maybe you've never understood why. Why though? Why Israel? What was God's purpose for them? What was the point? It seems like he was playing favorites. I don't understand what was the, what did, he, what did he start that nation for? What was their whole purpose? They didn't do very good. They pretty much failed, didn't they? They did. They did. And then in the book of Acts, in the New Testament, you have something completely new. It's called the church. Never, ever even seen or mentioned in the Old Testament. Never prophesied. Never, ever in the Old Testament. A complete mystery unveiled by Jesus Christ. I will build my church. What? Now, today, there are those who think, again, the church has completely replaced Israel because Israel looks like it failed. And so God cast Israel away and said, I'll start over. We're going to have this thing called the church. And many people today have no idea why God began the church. I, I, I'm not talking about this church. I'm not talking about Independent Bible Church of Duryea. We are the only church. Okay? We are one local assembly, and we're going to get to that. So well, now there are many things that, that parallel, and there are many things that seem similar between Israel and what we would call the church. And so we're going to look at those two institutions, Israel and the church, and just how does that play a part in what God's doing? Because many of people have opinions on the church. You say church to somebody, you, you might get people scowl. Oh, the church. Ah, fooey with the church. I've had it with the church. I was raised in church. Oh, the church. Who knows what they're talking about? They're talking about a denomination. They're talking about a religious thing. Uh, they're, all the church wants is your money. Ah, the church is a cult. They're trying to brainwash you. Why well, there be people looking through the window saying, you people here in Durie, what is wrong with you? You go like, what are you, would you sit there listening to that guy in a suit? What are you guys are like? You're little robots. Has he got you hypnotized? Huh? You're all sitting there. When he says leave, you're going to leave. Huh? And they, what is ah, the church. I can worship God however I want. I don't need the thing called the church. You have no idea, if you're honest, what God even designed the church for. I would dare say less than 5%, less than 5% of Bible-believing Christians have ever took the time to put a serious study in, serious study on their own of the church. I'm not saying you haven't heard preaching on it and teaching on it, but I doubt less than 5% of Bible-believing Christians have ever personally studied from the Bible on their own the church and developed from their personal study Biblical convictions and standards on church. Church attendance, church involvement, church membership, church ministry, and understood what God has. I think most just, this is what I did growing up, or this is what I didn't do, or this is what I think is okay, or this is what I believe, or oh, my parents did this, I'll do this, or blah, 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 it's all fine. And you have, you have a philosophy and you have an opinion, everybody does, but very little of it is ever really biblical, and I think a lot of it goes down to the fact that Satan has really, really worked hard. He doesn't want you to understand the purpose of the church. He just wants you to be happy that you come in once in a while, and that's got to be good enough, all right? And so let's take a look at these two institutions that seem the same, but are not. Israel and the church, and how do they play a part in this grand plan of the battle between God and Satan? And what part do you have in it? All right, so let's go in Exodus. We have to start in Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Now, I want you to understand, you're going to have to get your answers from the Bible. And, and God didn't give us just a little pamphlet, did he? He just said, here's the Bible, eight pages. And you're like, okay, good. Huh? No, 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 this is a pretty good-sized book. But God doesn't make mistakes, and he's holy and just, and he's perfect. So if he gave this whole book, it, the whole thing's important. Now, the devil wants you to say, you can't understand it. It's too hard for you. You didn't go to seminary. Uh, Greek and Hebrew and Latin and all that. You'll never understand it. Too bad. So big deal. I can't do it. It's overwhelming. I tried. I quit. Oh, well. You know, and so you just, a lot of people, a lot of people. And yet God, in his sovereignty, if you believe he's sovereign and he knows all things, many of you say, yes, I know it, I know it. This is what he gave us. So I want to question your beliefs. Do you really believe it? 
Do you really believe he knows everything? Do you really believe he can be trusted? Do you really believe that God chose the one thing for everybody is the Bible? The Word of God. 66 books from Genesis to Revelation covering a period of about 1,600 years, all right, as far as when it was written, about 40 different men, inerrant, infallible, trustworthy, no contradictions, no errors, preserved for his people, no matter where. This is just an English Bible. There are other Bibles in other languages, all right, as a sole source of truth, the mighty living word of God, the sword of the Spirit, he gave it to us. So I don't know, how, how, long, how much did you read this week? When was the last time you pulled it out? Teenagers, does it ever come out, mom, dad, unless they tell you to? Do you know where it is? Do you ever read it? How much time compared to the TV, games, devices, reading? Doesn't mean all those things are bad. How much time compared to watching a football game, sports, bowl games? How much time compared to shop? None of those things are all evil, but, but how much time? You're going to start seeing, whoa, if I really kept track, well, I'm not in it very much. And the devil says, exactly. I don't just give evil. I give just things to get your attention. Things that aren't even that bad. They're not, they're not sin. They just take your time up, occupy all your time and attention, get your stress worn out and harried, and you think, I don't have time for that, and you just never really read it. Just a little dose, do a quick little email devotion, that's good enough, I'm good, all right, check in once in a while. Oh, but the Word of God, the Word of God, you've got to be able to turn all pages, not just, he didn't give us one little book, one little page, you've got to know how to use it, the sword, there's a lot of ways, you've got to be trained in it. And so we start in Exodus, and if I were to ask you, hey, what was God's purpose for Israel, why did he start him? You might have silence. You know, I say, yeah, it always has sort of bugged me. Why are they the chosen nation? Well, you know, why did he, like, play favorites? And they're the apple of his eye. You know, that doesn't seem right. But what was the purpose of him starting from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then on? From them will come a nation which will bless all families of the earth. What was God's purpose? Well, he tells us that in Exodus 19. Take a look at Exodus 19. This is after the children of Israel have left Egypt. They're on their way to the land of promise, the wilderness. They're not even in the wilderness yet. They're getting ready. You know chapter 20 is the Ten Commandments. Moses is their leader. But notice chapter 19. Look at verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt. And don't forget, Egypt's always a picture of the world. Everybody understand that? In the Bible, Egypt is always a picture of the world. Sin. So notice, Israel was delivered out of Egypt. Interesting. Christ, as the Son of God, went to Egypt, didn't he? And then came out of Egypt. Now you start looking at that in the Bible. Joseph, picture of Christ. Moses, oh, Egypt, Egypt, all right. God's going to point that. He says, so they came out of the land of Egypt. The same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from, it gives you some cities there and places in the wilderness, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. So they're right before the big mountain, Mount Sinai. And Moses went up unto God. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now here it is, right here, very important verses. If you never marked these, I would mark them. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. He's talking about the Red Sea, and they all died. And how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. Here's the verse, verse 6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So God communicates this to Moses. Moses goes down and tells the nation of Israel, this brand new nation of a few million people, getting ready to come to the land of milk and honey. You got, you have, you did, there's nothing you did to deserve God's love. God has shown his love to you. He has hand chosen you. He has plucked you. He has blessed you. He has provided for you. You are a peculiar. That peculiar doesn't mean today like we look at someone like, they're a little peculiar, you know, a little odd. Their sense of humor, the way they, their personality is really peculiar. That, that, that's not what this Old Testament word here means, peculiar. Peculiar in the Old Testament Hebrew word means special. You're peculiar. You're set aside. You're a treasure. It's something, it's, it's like when you guys do Christmas, right? A lot of families like to do this. You're all done. All right, we're all finished. You're getting ready to pack up. And sometimes his dad says, whoa, 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 whoa. We've got one more special one. What, what? Yeah, I've, I've, I, oh, I fooled you. All right, Mom, sit down or so. All right, uh, everybody, hang on. I'm going to go get this here. I've, I've sort of set this one aside. Or, whoa, no, maybe you say, that never happens. Can we come to your house? All right? I don't know. All right? My dad did that all the time, so I don't know. He was famous for that. Whoa, we've got one more. 
We've got to go to the garage. What? What? You know, <laughs> Mom, oh, you know, and the idea here is no, it's set aside. It's special. It's a treasure. It's reserved. He said, Israel, I plucked you. I started you. I have a purpose for you. And if you will obey my voice, you will be for me, notice, a kingdom, a kingdom of priests. Now, this is before the tribe of Levi became the priestly tribe. You as a nation, you will be an entire kingdom of priests. Well, what was a priest? A priest represented people to God. A priest stood in between. You as a nation will represent me to all kingdoms of the world through Israel. You will, be, you will intercede for all the Gentiles. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and sacrifice for all nations to bring them to me. You will be a peculiar, valuable treasure unto me. And it says there, do you see that second part? You will be a holy nation. Set apart. A lot of people struggle reading the Old Testament. I, what is it? They had all these weird diets and things they could and couldn't do and their clothing couldn't be intermixed and they had all these feasts and festivals and com completely different than any other nation on the face of the earth for a purpose. You are going to be so holy and set apart and different that every people, group, and nation will look to you if you do it correctly and point to me. You will be a light to the Gentiles. You will be a royal priesthood. You will be a holy nation. Not like, well, there's some weird people. I can't believe they do. You, you alone hold to one God, creator. All these other nations, all kind of gods. Marriage, a man and a woman for a lifetime. Wow. I mean, you're, you're not going to do all that. You know, they, they plunder and kill. And, no, we're holy. We're set aside. We're going to obey God. We don't mix the, the good and the evil. There's a reason God did all those things as pictures looking ahead. And from Israel would come the deliverer. From Israel would come the deliverer. From Israel would come the word of God. The oracles, the very speakings of God that would be for all people throughout the entire world one day. Israel will be the protectors and, and the ones that write that down and guard it. Israel, if you will obey my voice. If you will obey my voice, you will be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, my people a light unto the entire world that will point to me and the coming deliverer, which the entire world needs. R. Kent Hughes says, they were separated as a nation to God, consecrated to serve him in holiness. Everything, right? Even the Sabbath. What, the, what are for these people on that Saturday? Or why do they dress like that? Or why do they do that? Why do they, why do, they do the, the blood on the doorpost back in, what? Why do they do all this stuff? To point to the coming deliverer. You need to be born again. You need to be saved. It's coming out. Do they all understand everything? Not necessarily. But they're called a light to the Gentiles in the book of Isaiah. Proclaiming the coming Messiah. Delivering the scriptures. From them would come all families of the earth be blessed. Now we have to ask you the question. Did Israel succeed in what God had for them? They didn't. We have the history in the Old Testament. Oh, there were times of great times where they were high peaks of some of the great moments where they had godly kings, David, Josiah, Hezekiah, godly judges. But you'll almost never see in the Old Testament them ever really reaching out to the Gentiles. They became an exclusive group. Oh, now, now the salvation was available to anybody. You'll see a few glimpses. Rahab, the harlot from Jericho, Ruth the Moabite. Salvation's always been open to everybody. But only a few would ever do that. Israel began to, they, 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 didn't, they didn't do what God wanted. And they became proud. They became very self-absorbent. They began to look at all of their things as, this is all that there is. And they weren't really concerned with everybody else. And it became just, and, so, and then we see what, Satan, now look, look, Satan's aware of all this. He, he knows what's going on. He's learned, you know, Satan has to learn things, folks. He doesn't know everything. He's not God. He didn't know about Israel. Once God told him about it, he, okay, so he begins to attack Israel. He, if, well, look, if, if my future is tied into the coming deliverer, and the coming deliverer is a Jew, well, that's an easy one. I'll just get rid of the Jews. If it's tied to the Scriptures, I'll get rid of the Scriptures. And so you see the battle in the Old Testament. You, sh you should see that battle as you read the Bible. And you go back and forth and back, but you know what? And he introduced wickedness and idolatry and fornication. And what was the warning? Do not intermingle with those other ones. Uh, and Israel would get sucked in. And what do you see in the Old Testament? Same as we're studying Sunday nights. Apostasy, apostasy, apostasy constantly. 
departing from the faith, departing from the word of God, intermingling with everything. Oh, idolatry and wickedness, ups and downs, ups and downs, and God was gracious, and God was long-suffering, and God gave them 1,500 years. And he sent servant after servant and prophet after prophet, all the prophets, to warn them and to bring them back, come back, and they, they didn't listen. There was times of revival, but not much. And largely, though, they were not a holy nation. They were not a kingdom of priests. They were not a light to the Gentiles. The ultimate rejection, of course, now we know, they failed, captivity, God brought some back, but the ultimate was when the king himself came. The king came to earth as a baby, walked among them, walked into Jerusalem, and said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The king is here. Israel, if you will receive me, I will set up my earthly kingdom right now. And Israel rejected the king. They rejected the king. They would not receive him, and they ultimately crucified him. And so what do you see? You see the great shift in the New Testament. Now, please don't think that God gave up on Israel. Remember that. It's not saying, all right, fine, I'm done with you. No, you, 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 if you read any part of the, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, minor prophets, you're going to see again and again, God, God says, I will restore my people. I will bring them back physically to the land, and I will restore them spiritually. They'll have to repent and receive the king, so I'm setting them aside. I'm not casting them off forever. The church does not replace Israel. Israel has a grand plan in God's scheme, but right now we would say Israel doesn't mean Jews can't be saved, but Israel as a whole is in rebellion. Their minds and eyes are blinded. Their veil is over their eyes, it says in Corinthians, and they've not received Christ as king. And so the whole purpose of end times and a lot of the tribulation is to restore Israel to its rightful place for them to repent and receive the king. Christ sets up the earthly kingdom. Satan is bound. And, and you start seeing all that, I hope, as you see the big picture. But Israel failed. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. He said, that's why if you read the Gospels carefully, what do you see? He sends out his disciples, go only to the lost sheep of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. He said himself, I'm only sent. I'm sent to only to the Israel. You'll notice the call went only to Jews. And some people read this, that don't seem fair. Well, you have to know what's going on in the Bible. Only the lost sheep of Israel. The, they rejected him. And then what happens? You see the great shift. You see the very first mention of the word church. I want you to turn there. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. You're in the New Testament. You're doing well. We're, we're making ground. We're flying. We're getting close. All right? Matthew 16. Oh, all right, so if you know anything about the book of Matthew, the kingdom is offered. They reject the king. Chapter 12, he begins speaking in parables. Parables were for, really for most people not to understand. He says, I'm using parables so that they will not understand. They won't see or hear. It's for only my children, only for the disciples to understand most of the parables. He begins talking about the kingdom of heaven. He begins talking about what's going to happen. Matthew 13 is that great chapter. Now, you're going to Matthew 16. All right, the Satan, you start seeing those things. And so what does the Lord begin to talk about and introduce when you get to Matthew 16? We get to this thing called the church, the church. Now, when I'm not talking about a church building, I'm not talking about a religious organization or a denomination. We're talking about the church, and we're going to define that for you. So you get to Matthew 16, and in verse 18... And I preached on this pretty thoroughly a couple years ago. I won't be able to break down the entire verse. Verse 18, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. Christ is speaking directly to Peter. Peter means pebble. Peter, you're insignificant. You're a pebble. But you gave a correct answer who I am. And I'm going to use you in a great way. But upon this rock, he said, myself, I'm going to build a church on me. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, that's the first mention of the word church. The disciples probably have no idea what he's talking about. There's nothing in the Bible, Old Testament about the church. Uh, this is new. This is mysterious. What are we talking about? The church, what is this assembly thing? Church is ecclesia. The call, it means a called out assembly. A called out gathering of believers. Notice, a called out one. A separated group. Hmm. Israel, delivered out of Egypt. A kingdom of priests. A holy nation. A light to the Gentiles. Failed the church called out assembly called out of what the world saved people the true definition of a church is not everybody in the church everybody who's here it's only those who are born again those who are redeemed God's people who've been called out of the world and delivered from Satan's kingdom 
called unto him, and they assemble together for the purpose that he has for the church. Now, I want you to keep these things in mind as we try to draw the net here. What is God doing? What is Satan trying to do? Why did God institute this thing called the church? Now, the church has been around now for about 2,000 years. From right after Christ's resurrection and ascension, the big beginning of the church is Acts, until right now, we're, we're right about 2,000 years. So, now there's still Israel is around, and, and they came back to their country in 1948, and they're there physically, but not spiritually. But God has grand plans for Israel, and he's not finished with them. And God reveals all of that in the Scripture. But they're temporarily laid aside, and so we have this mysterious parenthesis called the church. The church, this called-out assembly of believers that are going to, what for? Why does God have it? I don't understand it. Well, let's see what the Bible says. Stay in Matthew 16, and notice the shift. If you ever read Matthew, you'll start seeing the shift. Look at verse 21. From that time forth, Christ's message to his disciples began to change. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, they hadn't been, they hadn't been hearing that. They were so focused on the kingdom. Lord, he's coming. He's, right, he's the king. We're going to set up the kingdom. This will be great. We're going to get rid of Rome and we're going to rule with him. And from here on out, he begins to talk about Calvary. He begins to talk about the cross. They begin to lose the big crowds. The, a lot of people begin to leave. The people turn against him. And the disciples don't want to hear about that. They want the kingdom. And notice what happens, verse 22. Peter hears that. Peter takes him and begins to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Many people don't understand verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Oh! <gasps> should understand what's going on. He's Satan's, Peter's not Satan, but Peter, you are speaking as Satan. Satan does not want me to go to the cross. Satan wants me to take the kingdom right now. We already saw he offered it. Get to behind me, Satan. You're speaking in the spirit of the devil. You want the crown before the suffering. You want the glory without the cross. No, Peter's saying, Lord, that's not going to happen. You stop that. Quit talking about that. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what Satan wants. That's what he wants for all of us. Have it easy. Yet the Bible says if you're going to live godly, you're going to suffer persecution. You want to be like Christ? The cross comes before the crown. You willing for that? You want to suffer? You want to be part of the kingdom? Or do you just want the glory? You just want everything to be great? Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what Satan says. That's what he whispers. You don't need to suffer. You want to have friends. You want everybody to like you. Come on. You don't have to take a stand. Oh, come on. And that's what he's saying. You get there behind me, Satan. I know who's behind that thinking. I know who's behind that philosophy. Get there behind me. And you begin to see the shift. Christ begins to focus on the cross. He begins to withdraw from the crowds. The Jews have rejected him. His focus is on the cross. And you begin to see that shift in the Bible. I hope you see that. And by the time you get to the cross and the death and the burial and the resurrection, you have in Acts chapter 2, if you'll turn there and we'll wrap it up here, Acts chapter 2, you have the birth of this thing called the church. And here we are still today, some 2,000 years later. What is God doing? Acts chapter 2. We would say Acts chapter 2 is the birthday of the church. Gary is over here. Happy birthday, Gary. It's his birthday today. He's celebrating his day of birth. All right? <laughs> well, guess what? The church celebrates its day of birth, Acts chapter 2. And I know there are some who would disagree with that, all right? But Acts chapter 2, the birth of the thing that Jesus said, I will build my church. What is it going to be? It is going to be all people of all groups who receive me. No more barriers. No more Jews, Gentiles. No more barbarians and slaves. No, no, no. It's all been abolished. Christ fulfilled the law. He fulfilled every law of the Old Testament, ceremonial, civil, and moral. He fulfilled it. He paid the price. He took the sin debt. He took our place. He satisfied God's wrath. He said, it is finished. Nothing else has to be done. I fulfilled all of it. It's finished. It's canceled. Judaism is over. The temple no longer needed. If you were here in Sunday school, a lot of this ties into that. The temple no longer needed. Uh, Old Testament law, finished, no longer, it's grace, it's liberty, it's freedom in Christ, it's salvation, it's the church. 
And guess what? Not just one big central mega church. Churches throughout the entire globe. Local assemblies of believers who unite in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Planted in the devil's kingdom. Local churches made up of believers. God's people throughout the devil's kingdom. To propose, what? To give out the gospel. To stand for the faith. To make disciples in his name. One, until he says you're done. Now here we are today, we're at church. Well, why do we meet so many times? Why do we have to come? What's wrong with this? And will we, uh, well, are you beginning, I, I, are, do you know what the church is? Have you studied it? Have you ever read it? Do you have a firm belief on it? Can you give some doctrinal truths of what makes you come and not come? Why you only come? I mean, do you know? Do you have a reason? Why did the Lord begin this thing called the church, the called out assemblies, unveiled by Christ, fully revealed through the Apostle Paul in the epistles to the churches as we see it unfolded, what the Lord has. Christ, the root of Jesse, the son of David of the tribe of Judah, born of a virgin in Bethlehem, the Lamb of God, came and fulfilled everything in the Old Testament. He did not sin. He willingly gave himself as the Lamb he died, paid the price, suffered the death. He tasted death for every man. He provided the way to God, and he rose again, which was the sign and the seal. He reigns forevermore. He ascended to heaven, and he's at the right hand of the Father. He says, I'll, I live forevermore. I'm preparing a place for you, my children. You're going to come and live in God's kingdom forever, a place called heaven. And one day, the devil will be abolished, and so will sin and death and everything he has, and everything will be rightly restored, and the king will be on the throne. That's why you see a shift in the New Testament. What was the message after Calvary? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, not just to the lost sheep of Israel. Go ye into all the world and proclaim the good news. Make disciples in my name. All power and authority is given unto me, Matthew. Go teach and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what? Fill the devil's kingdom with my people. Plant local churches around. Pastors and deacons and church members who share the mission. Why? Because that's what the church is. You say, but this world's awful. You're correct. So God made the church. You know what this room is normally called? What is it? Sanctuary. Do you know what sanctuary means? Sanctuary means a safe place, a safe haven, a place of refuge. Guess where God wants his people while you're living on the devil's kingdom? He wants you to assemble together in a safe place. Not here to just get your money. Not here to make you robots. I didn't come up with the church. He did. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You start reading the scriptures and you'll start getting some biblical convictions. The Bible says that Christ is the head of the church. I'm not the head of the church. He is. The Bible says that he loved the church and he gave himself for it. Whoa. It says he purchased the church with his own blood. Oh, that's pretty important. That's very important. God does not look lightly on that. Wow. And then he says what in Hebrews 10? Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day, the day approaching, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ for the church. Because the Bible makes it clear what will be the world be like at Christ's return, almost full apostasy in professing Christendom. Be a lot of people who go to church and are religious. But as we looked at, Satan has been spreading his leaven. He has been sowing the tares among the wheat. Hopefully you begin to read the Bible and all this starts to make sense now. The parables, the tares, false believers among the believers, the little leaven that leavens the whole lump. A lot of things done in the name of the Lord, but they're false. They're not true. So he, God designed the church to be the standard of the truth, made of imperfect people. We're imperfect. There's no perfect church. There are hypocrites in every church, but to be the standard bearers for the cross, to be the mission fulfilled, go and preach the gospel, make disciples, share the good news with every person as a local church, be part of that church, serve, minister. You are given spiritual gifts. 
to serve in the local church, to build it to what God wants, to minister, to worship him. He changed a lot of those things. He abolished many things in the Old Testament. The church meets what? We said primarily on the Lord's Day, that Sunday, a day not just of rest, but a day of worship and ministering. A day where it's everyone coming to serve the king. The Bible should be the center. And we should love to assemble together. And if for any reason it's a duty, it's dreadful, you have to force yourself, you need to ask yourself, how did that happen? Are you a child of God? Do you understand what God, the miracle, the great design of the church Have you listened to the devil who says, you don't need it, you're good? Do you have any standard or conviction on it? A Bible conviction of what the church is and why God has it and what its mission is to evangelize the lost and to bring them into his kingdom. That's not just for the pastors, that's for his people. Every believer being a gospel witness of the good news. That's why it's so important. What are we studying Sunday night? Contend for the faith. Who's supposed to contend for the faith? God's people, the church. Know the faith. Contend for it. Keep it. You're the only ones that have it. <laughs> You've got it. You've got to deliver it to the next group until the Lord comes. You've got to be faithful to it. Oh, the devil wants you to compromise it and to discard it and to misquote it and to not interpret it properly. And he's got a lot of religion out there today. And there is a lot of confusion out there today. The devil is sowing the tares and he's sowing the leaven and he's very good at what he does and he hates the true church, which are believers. And he hates the word of God. And he hates the son of God. And he hates Israel. And God's not done with Israel. He's doing everything he can to make you think you're just okay the way you are. You're fine. You gotta go every time. You got your own life, don't you? It's a lot of fun things down here. That mean every little day he's got, no, no, no. God, God creates fun. God creates pleasure. Don't believe that the devil has all the fun. That's another lie. God's the creator of all good and pleasure. But you better do it his way because you'll get scars. So we have what God designed. Oh, the church. Well, our time is up. I've gone fast. I've given a lot of information here. Some of it may or may not make sense, but that's why in the Bible the church is called the pillar and ground of the truth. The church, that local institution where God's people meet. Say, oh, this world, my job, the neighbors, everybody, good. How about we go to church? And we come among God's people. Does that mean everybody that comes is saved? Oh, of course not. Does that mean everybody here loves one another? Of course not. Does that mean everybody, there's no anger, there's no bitterness, there's no gossip, no slander, no worldliness? Of course not. The devil is active. He loves to sow discord among the brethren. He loves burrs under the saddles. He loves little things to just get you. He wants to change the mission of the church. He wants you to do a lot of things that could be good, but you just don't get around to sharing the gospel a whole lot. You ever notice that? You can stay real busy doing lots of good things, but you're not really doing the main mission of the church, not bringing anybody into the kingdom. Not bringing anybody into the kingdom. You're not even telling anybody about the kingdom. You're not doing that. God says, oh, as you see this world get more and more wicked and apostate, and you see the advancing pages of Scripture coming true and the Lord's return coming soon. It is my will, Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, that you hold fast to your faith, that you forsake not the assembling, because that's going to be one of the quick things that goes. You're going to, just like a lot of, they're going to, they're going to forsake that. They're going to think life's a playground. They're going to forget it's a battlefield. They're going to forget, hold the fort for he's coming. Onward, Christian soldiers, you're going to forget the main mission is for your family to know Christ and all of your children to be in God's kingdom and to bring as many of your neighbors and family members to the kingdom of God one day and to defend this thing even to the death if you have to and to stay faithful until he comes because one day he is coming and it could be today. And if he comes today, guess who he's moving out of this world? The church. Not a denomination, not a label, the church. All saved, redeemed believers on the face of the earth that are his. Boom! In an instantaneous moment. Whoa. Everybody on earth will be lost. There won't be one saved person there. And thus begins the great tribulation, the Antichrist, Israel being duped, Israel's repentance, and the end of God's plan. Still a lot of time left at least on God's prophetic calendar. But what about right now? I have no idea. Think you're going to live to have another birthday? Celebrate another Christmas? How do you know? 
The devil's number one thing is, wait till tomorrow. You got plenty of time. Get, you'll get right with God when you're, pick a number, next year, after Christmas, January 1st, once you're married, out of high school, in college. You got time to do all of that. Just put it off to later. God says, now's the day of salvation. Now. Now's the time to serve him. Now's the time to be faithful. Now's the time to honor him. Now's the time to have biblical convictions. Now's the time to keep the faith and be all that God wants for you and I to be in this great thing called the church. Let's pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I gave you a lot of information. Your cup may be full and running over. You might say, that's a lot to take in. Well, praise the Lord, we have things called live stream. You can go back, watch it, and rewind, fast forward. But I hope the Holy Spirit of God took what I gave, my poor attempt at preaching, and illuminated your hearts and minds. Now, if you're here today or watching and you are not saved, it won't make a whole lot of sense. I want to say that lovingly. That's because your spirit, the Bible says, is dead. You've never been born again. It won't make much sense. It'll, it'll be a mystery to you. You don't have God's spirit to help you with it. Your greatest need is to be born again, not to understand everything. Your greatest need is to receive the gift of salvation and say, I believe that. I believe I'm lost. I don't believe that I can save myself or redeem myself. I don't think I can get to heaven by myself. I at least know that's true. Then your greatest need right now today is to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Your greatest need is to humble yourself in your heart if you think you're good, you're not. If you think you're righteous, you're not. And to say, dear God, I am a sinner. I am not worthy of heaven, but I see your grand plan. I see your great love and mercy. I see how you came yourself, sent your son, that we might be saved. I see he's the deliverer. I realize he died on the cross for me, and I believe that. And I'm coming to you this morning, Lord Jesus. Please forgive me of my sins, my sins. I own them, they're mine. Please forgive me, Lord. I want to run from them. I turn from them. I repent of them. And I ask you to forgive me. Please apply the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to my sins. Make me a brand new person, a child of God. Please come within me. Make me a brand new person. I want to be in your kingdom. I want to be in your presence one day. And I know that's not possible outside of Jesus Christ. If you're here today, maybe you just prayed that in the silence of your heart. Would you raise your hand so I can see it and say, Pastor Boyer, I did that right now. I called upon the Lord. I ask him right now today to save me. Is there anyone like that you wouldn't be ashamed? Don't be ashamed of your king if he's your king. Yes, I did that. I called upon him right now to ask him to save me. Anybody like that at all? Second question this morning is for those who name the name of Jesus. You say you're saved. You claim to be a child of God. But who do most people identify you with? Do you love the toys and the ways of the devil and all that the world has. It's fun. It's pleasure. You can just have a great time. You can just indulge in all the things that the devil has, music and media and things. Not all of it's sinful. Much of it is. Much of it's wicked. Do you enjoy just playing the casual Christian, just a, a little enough of church just to make you feel okay, not to feel guilty? Days and weeks and months go by. You really don't read your Bible. You don't really tell anybody about Jesus. You don't really even have a burden for the lost. You really sort of like this world and are sort of not necessarily excited about heaven. Do you identify more with Satan's kingdom or God's kingdom? Do you love coming to church? Are you thrilled at Sunday, the Lord's Day? Do you do any preparation to come? Do you look forward to ministering and serving and getting excited to teach boys and girls or others to encourage, to comfort, to pray with one another? Do you love church? Or maybe you'd have to be honest and say, oh, dear God, please forgive me. My heart's grown so cold. I don't love church. I don't love coming. I like to get in and get out. I enjoy when we don't have it or it's canceled. I like when it's short. I like when I can get on with my day. I don't really, I don't really love church, God. Please forgive me, though. It's time for me to get serious. I've got to study the scriptures. I've got to see what the Bible says. Oh, Lord, forgive me. You gave yourself for the church. You gave it with your own blood. It's yours, Lord. I've not honored you. I've gotten disappointed in my heart. I've not liked it. I've said there's too many people here that aren't Christ-like. 
Lord, I, I, I'm so discord. I have anger and bitterness. I don't do my part, Lord. I sit on the sideline, perhaps. I don't know what it is. Maybe God spoke to your heart. Maybe you're willing to get that right. As our pianist begins to play, it's a time to swallow your pride, to be humble. Are you willing to do business with God? Are we going to just play church? Everybody here today is right with God and everybody's great. Everybody loves church and they come for the right reason. Look at that. We're all good. We're all good preachers. Don't worry. You're preaching to somebody else. Everybody here loves one another. They come to encourage. Nobody has anything against anybody here at this church. We're a great church. No one's involved in worldliness. No one's involved in wickedness and sin. No one's going to move. We'll just sit in our pew like we always do. Between you and the Lord, God worked in your heart. I'm just the preacher. I'll let the Holy Spirit work. God spoke to your heart and you need to be saved. Would you slip out right now? We can help you right now, right here at the front, take you to a private room. You can trust Christ. Oh, what a day that would be. Don't let the devil tell you tomorrow. Don't let the devil tell you you've got to be busy today. He wants to take you to hell with him. Now, if you're a Christian sitting here, and boy, there's a wrestling match going on. I mean a wrestling match, but you are proud and you are stubborn. Will you let the Lord have his way, or are you just going to keep on the way you always are? Maybe even destroying this local church through slander, gossip, hypocrisy, evil speaking, withholding forgiveness, just going through the motions. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're going to let the Lord work. It's between you and God. Do you love God? Do you love His church? Do you understand the mission? Are you part of that mission? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Pianist plays. Interestingly enough, in Hebrews, right before the forsaking the assembly, it says, harden not your hearts. Harden not your hearts. Hold fast. Forsake not. Keep the faith. Be all that God wants you to be for his honor and his glory. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to assemble. What a privilege to assemble together this morning. Lord, may we look at it as a wonderful privilege. There's no guarantee that we'll be back tonight. Now, Lord, we have it on the calendar. We have a baptismal service ready. We know that we're doing that because you commanded it. And I'm excited about tonight, Lord. We should never, should never get old to see folks saved and baptized. We should never get old to see folks be part of a church. And Lord, if it's gotten old, oh God, help us. Lord, you tell us so many times, love not the world neither the things that are in the world. Be not conformed to this world. Oh, Lord, the devil is unresting. He wants to conform us to this world, to love the things of this world so much more than the things of God. Oh, God, help us to be true believers. Oh, God, I pray if there's any here today that believe they're saved, but they're truly not, would you show them today? Show them that they're not yours, Lord. They need to be born again. Lord, if there's those today that have resisted your spirit, they have resisted the Holy Spirit, Oh, God, in your mercy, give them another chance. God, this is not my church. It's your church. Oh, Lord, you love this church. You have a plan for it. Oh, Lord, I pray you'd keep this church pure and clean. Lord, I pray you'd be full of God's people, full of believers who love you, would come with a clean heart. Lord, I've done what I believe you've laid on my heart, Lord. I've searched my heart, made sure I'm right with you, and then I proclaim the Bible as you laid it on my heart. Lord, I'm not responsible for what everybody does. Each one stands before you. I pray that we can walk out today with a clean conscience and a heart full of joy, eager to be back tonight to assemble together. Thank you, Lord, for your great plan. Thank you that you are sovereign. Thank you for salvation, which is available to every person, free to whoever will call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, dismiss us with your great love. Bring us back tonight, eager to serve and to minister and to gather in this safe haven for another service. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.